At this point, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Roger Shaw. He has spoke already this week here, so he's, uh, I'm going to allow him to go ahead and introduce himself. He does a better Sounds job of that than anybody can. Sounds like a winner to me. There you go. So after you, sir. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. All right. Welcome. <laughs> so should uh, we hear it for him? There oh, we go. Oh, don't do that. My God, that puts stress on it. And we're going to talk about stress. Uh, Roger Shaw, I'm from Airman Education Programs down in Oklahoma City. We run the Altitude Chamber Global Survival Courses down there. We have the portable oxygen training environment out here to give you oxygen at about 28, 9,000 feet. And that's our job. Been doing that for about 25 years uh, down there. And I was 24 years before that in the United States Air Force. I flew a caribou of Vietnam. And then I went to a B-52 for four years and then rescue helicopters, retired in 92. This December, I'll have 25 and a half of the FAA. I think I'm going to retire, but I'm not sure because my wife might kill me in the garden. That's stress that I'm going to talk about. You've got to look at the environment you're going into. So I go, to the, I go to work to rest. So that's my background. I flew a while in the Air Force, and I've been teaching physiology. I've, what I've done is I have gleaned uh, some stuff. We do a two-day CRM course. Is this my buzzer right here? Perfect. I gleaned stuff out of the uh, two-day CRM course for new academy inspectors that come out of the FAA that we've been teaching since 2005. And basically all the information I'm going to pass on to you with fatigue and stress and why it's still a factor is from the PhDs over in CAMI, which is Research Human Factors, and then some of the other PhDs at the University of Oklahoma and some places where we gleaned out this stuff. Uh, my background academically, I had a Master's in Education from Portland State, and a Master's in Aeronautical Science from, uh, where was it, Emory Riddle? Yeah, <laughs> I graduated in the University of Oklahoma with a bachelor. I'm living proof that your English can be terrible and still get two masters. My wife teaches English as a second language. She's an English teacher, and she always says, how do you teach? Your words aren't quite right, and your sentence structure's terrible. And I go, well, I teach pilots. I show them pictures. So, if I say something during this preview, you go, what the heck did he say? Come up later. You know, you eat enough crow, it tastes like chicken. It won't matter, okay? So we're going to talk about that. And the reason, we, why do we still have problems with fatigue and stress? Why do you think we have that? Well, normally in a classroom, I'd get some feedback. Since we're being recorded, I can't do that. So I'll show you probably one of the reasons why, if it works, which I expected not to work, okay? Now... That last night I spent a long time working on these videos to run. I didn't expect them to run. I had a really good reason why, and it's not going to show it to you. So I'll have to tell you a joke. No, I'm not going to tell you a joke yet because you're wide awake. Let's go on to definition of human factors, okay? The reason we're talking about this stuff is for safety and efficiency in a cockpit. And we're going to try to talk about, I'm going to give you what causes fatigue, the acute, the chronic, same way with the stress, it's sort of the same. The problem is it's gray. It's not hard to grab onto. I'll give you some reasons how to, comp how to fight it, okay? We probably should have this room packed because starting tomorrow, where's everybody going? Home. And they've been here all week, not sleeping as good, probably having some parties, getting dehydrated, We're doing a lot more walking than they're doing, and then they're going to stress out and they're going to go fly an airplane. So fatigue is going to be a factor, and it could be stressful depending on the departure and what kind of stuff. The good part is the weather's not bad. We're going to have a great, pretty good departure route out of here all the way through Monday. So here's how we fight fatigue and stress. This is the CRM skills that we have available up there. And under communication and processing, I want to take a look at briefings, preparation, and planning. Those two areas right there you need to focus on if you're fatigued and stressed. You need to spend more time on the ground before you launch to make sure that you have a grip on it. Doesn't mean you don't fly if you're tired, but you've discussed it, especially with the crew, and you're looking at the environment before you take off, and you make a decision so you don't get, get home-itis and then get yourself in trouble, okay? That's really, really important. That's where, if you look at the accident rate in the NTSB website, a lot of times it's because they didn't spend any time on the ground doing preparation and planning. They get airborne, 
and then all of a sudden they didn't leave any wiggle space in there for their flight and they get a stressor on them and when that pucker factor starts kicking in the processes don't operate too well especially if you don't have currency and proficiency in the system that you're flying so you need to take that into effect when you take a look at this stuff okay this won't work either I can tell you the first two videos will not work because they worked last night they won't work up there so I'm not going to worry about it let's talk about fatigue okay definition characterized by increase lessened capability for work reduced efficiency or loss of power or capacity to respond to stimulation now what type of fatigue are we going to talk about we're going to are we talking about physical fatigue yeah a little at 73 going to be 74 I go out in the garden and I got two hours and then it's over because it's I'm done okay but what we deal with in, in the aviation business is not so much the physical stuff as is the mental. Okay, and when you're tired, you're not processing information as well. How much? I'd like to be able to tell you how much you're losing, but I can't tell you because it's gray. You gotta start to look in the mirror and say, whoop, I'm tired. I know when we took off in a B-52, we flew all night long, once a month, we take off early in the evening fly all night long and do landings early in the morning as the sun came up. We were tired because that's not our normal process. We only did it once a month or so. And everybody had a letdown plate because we're shooting approaches at the end of the thing to get current. So everybody had a letdown plate because everybody said, let's watch it. We looked at the preparation planning and said, hey, we're tired. You know, watch us because we can make some brain cramps and make some bad mistakes. So you got to take a look at that where you're taking off and where you're landing. Is it normal? Have you got anything else that affects you in that business? Short term is acute fatigue, long term is chronic. Which one do we control the easiest? Acute fatigue, because it's right now, usually dissipates, chronic is longer term, okay? Affects acute fatigue or short duration, usually, catch the word usually reversed by what? Sleep and relaxation. Now, we're gonna talk about sleep and we're going to talk about relaxation. How many people consider Oshkosh relaxation? Yeah, that's our, that's, I mean, that's your, you go here to recreate, right? But it's still a little stressful. You can't divide stress and fatigue, you know? It's, it's different than what you've been doing for seven days in a row somewhere, okay? So also sleep is different. I don't sleep as well at the comfort suites even as I do at home. You know, it's just different, so I'm not sleeping as good as well. We'll talk about sleep and some of the factors that affect sleep, because I think that's probably the number one problem that most of us have. Okay, chronic is more than three months long, by definition, which means that fatigue is going on and on and on. What happens if you go longer than that? You get somebody asked about this oh, a year ago. Chronic fatigue syndrome. Bottom line is six months or longer of stress. And what happens? You get sick. Okay? So that's got some stress involved in it. Okay? I saw this actually happen. I saw a student that working on a master's Monday and Wednesday night class and a Tuesday, Thursday night class, full-time job, and adopted another kid. After six months, I got sick. Okay? There's just so much on the plate, and there's so much going forward there that you're just not resting, and they were fatigue 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 you get sick how do you measure it it's gray but you do not want that you don't want chronic fatigue syndrome okay increases that you can see in people I put in increase loss or gain of weight weight gain insomnia depression these are the things that affect us in the cockpit irritability physical emotional isolation why is that remember the CRM skills what communications Number one is communication, prioritization. Communication goes down because you've had enough and decreased alertness and attention. Okay? Our guys out there, we've been doing this six days in a row. We put a pilot in that thing, every five of them in that tent every, every 30 minutes, and by now we're a little hitting the wall because we're doing the same thing over and over and over for six days, eight hours a day. We don't get out of the hangar. And so, we can get a little irritable, you know, and if you're irritable, you're not communicating as well, okay? So those are some of the things that are observable signs in fatigue. 
Which one of these categories of fatigue do you control? I won't let you answer that because I got to, then I have to get you to. It's individual, okay? You control the individual. You don't control the environment too much, and operationally it depends on what kind of flying you're doing. So let's talk about individual. Physical fitness, sleeping habits, improper diet, dehydration, overweight, <laughs> drug, medication, caffeine. The biggest one that we control is this, dehydration. As Americans, we don't drink enough water, okay? Check your urine out. If darker yellow it is, you've got more problems, you need to drink some water. We drink a lot of coffee, soda stuff, good beer at night stuff. Dehydration you can control. Sleeping habits, we'll talk about that in a minute. Physical fitness, how many times a week are you supposed to work out? I got a minor in exercise physiology, by the way. How many, t <laughs> how many times? Well, let's go. Let's see. 30 minutes, five days a week. Uh -huh. I got a uh, triple bypass a year and a half ago. Found out, wow, I had no pains. I just found out I was on a flight physical. Thank you. You ought to take a flight physical once in a while and get it checked out. It saved my life. So, you know, I got no pains? I go, no, I don't got no pain. Well, you got 100%, 85 and 84 over here. We got to fix it. So they fixed me. So they said, get on this bicycle and do it 20 minutes a day, four times a week. I have a total gym in the basement. I have a elliptic machine in the garage I can't use anymore because I played college basketball and the right knee went out. So that's gone to the Salvation Army. And how many times have I got on that elliptic machine bicycle? <laughs> Last three months have been on it zero. But I go in the garden. I work in the garden, OK? You know, you can always excuse yourself. Right? Like, Here's the point is we don't do enough walking. You do here. That's another fatigue fact. You probably don't walk as much at home as you walk here if you got one of those little things. Man, you're doing a lot of walking around this place. So anyway, you need to take a look at exercise. Uh, let me give you a shoe leather what's happening in the world. First of all, we sold it wrong. As phys ed people, we sold 80% exercise, 20% diet. We should have been selling 80% diet, 20% exercise. Okay, because we're wearing ourselves out. And you need to look at what you're eating because the knees go, the body goes, and then pretty soon you can't do anything. You turn 50, metabolism starts going down. Right knee goes out, no more two hours of hoops playing, having a good time. You can go swim. E -e -e. That sucks. I don't do that. So the swimming goes down, exercise goes down, the lifestyle stays the same. What happens? Seasoning. And then I'm going to tell you, it's 73. It don't come off unless you stop eating, and that sucks. You I mean, come to Oshkosh, you know. I got a stress test next Thursday. I'm going to try to lose weight for that. I'll have to starve starting Sunday or through Wednesday night to get to the goals. So back off a little. If you're in here skinny, go out and have all you can eat now because it's coming. Okay? Uh, this is a front. Uh, <laughs> uh, none of this stuff's going to work on their computer. I knew it wouldn't. Here's the sleep physiology right here. Let's talk about sleep. Sleep becomes less, more disrupted, and talk after you get over 50. Okay? Three point times greater in long haul age 50 to 60 than 20. In other words, the older you get, you're sleeping more and getting what? Less. Okay? So you've got to take that into effect. For most of us, if you're over 50, 60, what happens to you at night every time, at least twice? You get up and go to the bathroom. And then you got to start the cycle all over again. And you're going, what the freak's going on? My, <laughs> the, my story is my wife had a cold one night, and I get up about twice a night to go to the bathroom. She, she, I said, I'm not going to sleep with you because i got to go TDY. So I went down to this bedroom, and uh, I slept in there. And about a week later, she says, man, those two nights you slept down there, you didn't have to. She can hear her squeaks in our house. we got an old house. She says, you didn't. You didn't get up at all. You really slept good through the night down there. So like, yeah, I really did. I didn't tell her because my grandpa had what they call an old slop bucket. I just took an old bucket in the garage in the, next to the bed so I didn't have to walk down to the bathrooms. You know, I told her later, well, I did get up twice. I just pee in that and dump it later. You know, but uh, you could do that. But it does. It disrupts your sleep. So you've got to take a look at that, okay? Uh, disruptive sleep, that's what we're talking about. Deeper, dark room, quiet. Cool temperature, comfortable sleeping service. The PhDs say, you walk in that bedroom, it's supposed to be dark. Whew, you go to sleep, there's no TV in there, no computer, no computer, nothing, no reading in bed, no crossword puzzles, nothing. You go in there and boy, it's beautiful, you know? And uh, guess who has a trouble sleeping? The wife. 
I showed her all this stuff. I showed her all this PDF. She reads in bed, does a computer, does crossword puzzles. I said, wait a minute, Susan, you're supposed to turn the TV off 30 minutes before you go to bed so the BBs stop operating and you can go. I don't think that has anything to do with it. Now this is, you can be right or you can be happy. 49 years has proven that, okay? So I say, oh, okay, okay. So, so I just, what I do is in the king size bed, I got a big pillow wall I build up. It's about five pillows high and I dive into that because I sleep great, you know. And somebody after this talk came up and said, oh, I sleep great, like reading in bed. I, well, if you're sleeping good, reading in bed, generally that's okay. If you took the countermeasure course with NASA, how much sleep are you supposed to get? Eight plus or minus two. And it depends physiologically because they're all different and how many stressors are on you and what affects you. So you've got to take a look at that, especially if you're going to start flying somewhere, okay? Dark room, there you go. Here's, I want to show you this. Right here, right down here is about 30 minutes. If you don't go past that, you won't go into deep sleep, and that's where you get that power nap, okay? You can take a little 15-minute nap, and everybody's different. Some people go 15 minutes and go, whoo, down in that sucker. Some people do, t I can sit at my desk at FAA, Eyes open, fingers moving, I'm sleeping, they don't know it. But it took 25 years to fix that up, and I'm going to retire, so I don't mind telling them. But that takes training. You can't just do that overnight. Take a nap, a little 10-minute nap. Really give you alertness if you have the capability to do that because you really do affect yourself in that area. My dog, Moses, here's a combat. He's sleep anywhere. You know, I got a picture like that of me, but I don't show it. Moses, I kicked him off that chair moved him over into a couch, he could sleep anywhere he wants. Man, this guy can sleep. Take, that's what you need to do, be able to take a nap, a little 10-minute nap. I want to show you one more study right here. Take this into effect. This is really important for Oshkosh, Sun and Fun, those seven-day shows. They gave these groups eight hours sleep, one night, two nights, three nights. Then after that, for a week, they give this group nine hours of sleep every night, seven, five, four, three, excuse me, three. They took alertness test every night and look at it over the week. Then at the end of that week, they gave everybody eight hours sleep because they think we could go, well, you can catch up with deep sleep, you know, and come back. So they gave them three nights in a row with eight hours sleep. What happened to them? These groups never did catch up, okay? They're still down here as far as alertness. These guys are increasing. So what I'm saying is you look at accidents at the end of the NTSB website, what was the person doing a week before? How much good sleep were they getting a night and things like that? So you gotta take a look at who you are and what you're doing the week before. And if you've been spending a whole week here, it doesn't mean you don't fly home, but you're, you could be tired, especially when it comes to decision making and alertness, okay? Just take it into process. Doesn't mean you don't fly, you just communicate it. Especially if you got a crew, say, hey, watch me. I'm not up to snuff. You guys are looking on me hard, man. You need a joke. I got a uh, chicken coop in Oklahoma. I do have 15 chickens. Uh, you can't answer this because I'll just give it to you. And that, in that chicken coop, I had to put two doors. You know why? If you put four doors, it's a chicken sedan. See, this is free, okay? It's on tape. You know, that's the best one I got. You know, I got others, but they really are bad. Anyway, watch what you're doing the week before because it's important, especially with sleep. Environment, family, work environment, bad weather, noise and vibration, high. This stuff, what about this? This really affects me. I hate summer. And I sweat like, oh my gosh, this up here is like heaven. Oklahoma was 105, 106. It finally kicked off, but when I left there, I, was, I didn't even go out to the pool. I just too stink. I hate July and August. Oh, I don't. My, my mom says you can't say you hate it. Okay, I know, Lord. Uh, okay, it's not my favorite. I want to snow, man, to get a goosebump or something. Up here is great. So it does have an effect on you. Family has an effect on you, especially with fatigue because you don't sleep as well, and it will cause some stressors. And I'll talk about that and we get into stress. Okay, this is cold weather. Some people like it. Some people don't. Causes mental stress. Some people, how about this? This is about 108 degrees right there. That's hot, man. You're dehydrating, you gotta drink water, you gotta take a look at the environment that you're flying in, because it does affect the body, which does affect the brain, which causes some fatigue and stress, okay? Heavy work schedule, this is operational stuff. This is things that you got to do with if your job. Uh, we fixed the time zone stuff. Here's what the FAA 
we got those overseas guys giving them more time. But let me tell you something. Three to four days, you got to be on the ground before you catch up. If you're going transatlantic, it takes five to six. One of my daughters is in Papua New Guinea with new tribes. Her husband stepped on a, on a thing. He's got to get an operation in Sydney out of Papua New Guinea that hauled him out of there, out of the jungle. My other daughter wants to fly down and help her sister. She's gonna, she wants to leave and go down and help. I said, you know how long it's going to take to fly down there? No. I said, you'll leave Dallas, and 17 hours later, you'll hit Sydney. That's a long time, and you're going to go with some of this stuff right here, and it will cause you some sleep. You go east is least, west is best. If you're heading east, you're going against the sun. That causes more stress for most people. Going west is really usually easy. You've got to take a look at that and who you are. Some people don't bother, okay? Uh, recognition operational area. If you overlay, if you overlay these top three, technical errors, task saturation, distraction, channelized attention on something, if you overlay that in the research on loss of situation awareness in the cockpit, the top three are identical. So they're identical to loss of SA and the fatigue are the same. Remember this thing, slow reaction time, poor judgment, that's risk assessment, okay? Lack of discipline, oh wow, there's that inner bill. <laughs> we don't like each other when you get tired, you know? You gotta be real careful with that. Lower your standards. If you lower your standards, what happens to risk assessment? It goes down. So if you're tired, your risk assessment's gonna go down because you just don't wanna fool it. You just wanna get it on, you know? Okay? Now, this is blood alcohol on a drunk, okay? This is sleep study after about 19 hours. Look at that. They're identical. Okay, they're identical to being drunk as far as making decisions. So if you're up that long, you're, look at that. That's the same as being drunk, making decisions. Okay, so if you're drunk or sleep deprived, you're impaired. So how much are you not getting sleep? You gotta take a look at that because that's where you're at. You're not making those decisions. Uh, question right here. Anybody got a mic? They got to be on a mic so they can record this. Okay. It's just a comment. That's uh, yeah. that's what doctors do all the time. That's so right. Those are the guys that are. That's I work for the Silver Earthquake Medical Institute. The worst people there are is the doctors. They send them in those. When you go in the emergency room, you ought to ask how long you been on, doc. <laughs> yeah. When he did that triple bypass, I asked him, how much you been sleeping the last couple of days? There's a lot of CRM skills that are going. A lot of. CRM is going into the medical business because time and death are a factor in aviation. They're the same thing in an operating room, same thing in an emergency room, so communication, prioritization, workload is very important, so fatigue and stress are a factor, so yes, they do. Well, all we do is giving you this information, and you've got to decide it's a factor. Sometimes you you not get a chance. This is Zunberg. He had a real problem with that stuff. Let's talk about stress because I'm going to try to get you some stuff. The reason we don't do this stuff. Stress, bottom line, anything that what? Disrupts the body natural balance. I don't know what that is for you. We had seven kids. My dad was the only child. We had two boys. We were six years apart. He came to our house. He spent about two days. He went home. He came here. My gosh, there's never too much action going on. It was just unbelievable. He couldn't take it. He said, yeah, at least. He said, you're going to work till you're 100 to take care of this. I said, well, maybe I'm working till I'm 74, that's for sure. But uh, uh, stress is anything that affects you, that disrupts you, gets you hacked off, doesn't make you make good decisions. Communication, prioritization, and workload is disrupted because of that stress. It will affect fatigue, okay? There's four, three types. Noise and temperature, we talked about that under fatigue. This is sleep loss, we talked about that. Fatigue, we talked about psychological stressors, mental workload, social or emotional factors. That's the psychology of it. That's the stuff up here that has a lot of factors to it. Like my son-in-law down in Australia now get his leg operated on because he cut some tendons in a ditch in the jungle. So is that a stressor for me? And eh, a little, I'm not, you know, a stressor I had last week, I had to put my lab at 13 years down. Whew, man, I, I wouldn't want to fly the next day. I mean, I could barely drive a car. 
So you say, well, that just, that's just a dog. Well, what, everybody's different. So whatever disrupts you, it causes you stress, you need to take a look at that. So you say, woo, I know that affects me. Process it in that crew resource management, pre-briefing, planning if you have to go somewhere. And when you do that, you at least process the information. In the military, you wanted to start talking on a pre-brief. You got financial problems, you got divorce problems, you didn't have to elaborate. How are you doing today? Is there anything affecting you up here under periods of stress? Because under periods of stress, sometimes you don't operate well because there's stuff hidden in there and you don't deal with it. You going to behave yourself? Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to get anything out of those videos. I should have bought my computer. Uh, stress. Predictable universal reaction to what? Fatigue, we talked about it. Time pressures, that's probably the number one problem. Most of the NTSB websites, I say, listen, if you take off today and make a flight plan, and you take off and you're going from here to here, and there's a change in that profile that you planned, the hair ought to come up on your neck. I don't care what it is, weather, maintenance, whatever it is, if there's a change from what you planned, you need to be careful, okay? Because that time, and you haven't left any wiggle space in there, when that pucker factor, that time pressure kicks in, we don't operate well with that, okay? Some people do, but they got a lot of experience, a lot of currency, okay? But you've got to put that in there. Difficult or unexpected circumstances. As crew members, we like black and white. We don't like change, okay? We just don't care for that. If there's a change in the flight profile, be careful. And if you're walking around with two legs and you don't have personal problems in your family or whatever, you're very fortunate. And you need to process that because it's, it, it's there and you gotta deal with it. Some of it you can control, some of it you can't, but at least you process it when you're going flying and, talk and think through it because it could affect your decision-making process, okay? Uh, okay, let's see here. This is what I wanted to show you. Acute fatigue and chronic, same as fatigue, but it's stress. The threat can be what? Real or imagined? It doesn't even have to be real. It can be what you think is coming and it'll cause you some stress. And that's that mental stuff that just tears you up. You gotta dump that. Because if it's not real, then don't deal with it. The fight or flight is what acute does. Basically, we hit it, we deal with the stress, we dump it, we go on the next, on with it, okay? You're built to handle it. You're built to, fight or flight response, you're built to handle acute fatigue. You're not built to handle chronic fatigue. What's it called? High pressure jobs, loneliness, traffic, kids, dogs, whatever you want to call it that disrupts your stressor. And here's the, here's the latest right here. Estimated that 90% of doctor visits are for what? Conditions where stress or at least plays a role. In other words, 90% of our illnesses, stress has done something to affect how much we don't know. But it says be anxious and nothing for a reading, reason, you know. Process the information, do what you can do with it, and if you can't deal with it anymore, then you just drop it off the ledge. Go to the next one, next one, okay? You're gonna have to, that's up to you. I don't, I'm just telling you what it is, but it will play a role in your processing of information and your decision-making process, okay? If the chicken crosses the road and comes back, gets in a mud puddle while he's over on the other side, he comes back, what is he? A dirty double crosser, okay? You don't, that's okay. You don't have to applaud. <laughs> I don't get any videos. I got to do something there. My gosh. That guys are sabotaging me up there in the booth up there. <laughs> I'm going to blame the IT guys. Okay, here's stressors in aviation. Time pressure, workload, terrain, weather, traffic, pressure from the company. You don't have that. System malfunction, social pressure. Okay, that's that peer pressure, social pressure that I got to do what I got to do because I'm a pilot. And, that, and that's there. It, the Air Force has got it in their Elasa SA class. Peer pressure, things like that. You know, I gotta do it because I'm the pilot. We don't have ego problems. You hear about the guy on his first date, the pilot? Took her out, got 30 minutes through the meeting, 45 minutes, talking, and he said, listen, I'm sorry to her. I've been talking 45 minutes on flying only. That's not fair. 
Let's change the subject. Let's talk about me. Usually the girl laughs, the guys don't. Hey, wait a minute, I don't think that's funny. Malfunctioning, but social pressure is the thing that pushes you to do some silly things in decision making, okay? High level, low level, situation fatigue. This is a, uh, we use it in the class. You want to operate up here. This is performance. This is a Yahtzee Dotson curve. You want, this is performance here, and this is, wow, stress or arousal. You want to operate up here, okay? Acceptable level of arousal, in other words, it keeps you engaged with the flying business, engaged with the cockpit, engaged with everything, okay? If you get too much stress and you haven't planned for it and you get all that jammed up the BBs up here, you're going to run over here in distress, okay? Why are you, what would cause you to be over here where it says boredom and complacency? What caused you to be over there? What's in a cockpit that causes you to be bored? Automation. It's doing it all for you. You're not staying up with it. You punch it in, boom, boom. It's taking you. You've been doing it for a year now. Everything's fine. Everything's working good. You don't need to stay up in the airplane. And then all of a sudden it has a brain cramp or a, something goes wrong with it. And you go from over here to over here because you're not staying up with the aircraft. We've seen that in big airplanes and some airlines and stuff like that. You need to stay engaged with the airplane even if the automated system's there and you have to fight complacency and boredom which is what happens to you down there, okay? Check your proficiency, check your currency. When you go with flying your airplane, how much do I have as far as what, how much can I operate this aircraft? Do I understand the automated systems? And if you don't, you can still go fly, but you just look at the pre-brief and the preparation and planning, and you take what you can handle. You don't take any more than that. If you can't get that, you don't go fly, okay? None of my videos are working on any of this stuff, guys, nothing. I sh ah, Threats caused by fatigue. Poor sleep, we talked about it, okay? Work schedule, circadian rhythm disruptions. Oh, recreation and extracurricular activity. What's that? That's ice cars, isn't it? It sounded fun, or whatever it is, a week on the lake, on vacation, you come back to work to do what? Rest. <laughs> you come back and say, oh, I'm tired. I had a great time, but boy, I'm tired. Where do I get back Sunday? I'm sleeping all day Monday, man. I'm going to take Oklahoma out. <laughs> so it's something you need to take a look at. Tedious task, automation. Okay? How much are you using it? Gets boring. You, you, you don't stay up with it. That won't work either. Nothing's going to work. Okay. Tips for managing fatigue and stress. Discussion among team members or whoever's on the cockpit. They don't have to be a pilot. You can just say, hey, watch me. You know, check my six. We're going in here. This is what we're looking for. You know, use a CRM. Even if they're not a pilot, they're still in the cockpit with you. Review the goals, planning, use a checklist, increase your cross-check. Okay? CRM skills we talked about under high periods of stress. You don't rise to occasion, but sink the level of your proficiency. Take a look at what you got as far as your currency and proficiency. Okay? This is uh, stress relief. These guys right here in 1923 were the richest people in the world. Okay? What do you think happened to him? Swab, he died a pauper. This guy, Hobson went nuts. Whitney, he died from, <laughs> this guy took himself out. He was penniless. This guy shot himself, this guy. Now, why do I put that up there when it comes to stress? Let me show you why. This guy right here won the PGA in 1923, Gene did. What happened to Gene? Played golf till he was 92, died at <laughs> 1990, age of 95, he was financially secure. What's the moral? Screw work, play golf. <laughs> My wife said, don't put that up there. That's that. That's not proactive stuff. You can't put that up there. What I'm saying to you is this. Don't let stress ruin your life. You know, back it off, chill out a little. We're, our lifestyle is like this. We're rolling, you know. We're just rolling. You know, it's just... Pull it off a little. Sit back, take a little time off, and do nothing. You know, just and it's tough to do that because we're not. We're used to. I'm going to retire in December. And I'm going to have to learn to just. Now I'm not going to stop and die. You know, they say, well, if God died, he didn't do nothing. I'm not going to do that, but just take it easy. You're going to have to just. That's a change, by the way, in my lifestyle, and that will cause some stress that has to be dealt with. Okay. Uh, 
Let me talk to you about attitude real quick because we got time because I didn't get to run the video. That's good. Attitude is the way you feel or think about someone else, okay? How do you know about it? Feel aware. It's a behavior. How do you tell somebody's attitude toward the subject, whether it's CRM, whether it's flying, or you, or what? You usually tell by their behavior, and these are the traits we have in aviation. We like success. We don't like feelings. <laughs> My mom, when I turned 50, I started crying at the graduations and the funeral. Mom said, what's wrong with you? You started crying at all these things? And nothing. You disgusting old fat pilot crying you know I said well I'm getting in touch with my side and so I I showed her this t-shirt they had this about seven years ago out here at Oshkar it said the average pilot despite the sum what extraordinary exterior is much capable of feeling love affection intimacy and caring right below it it said this these feelings just don't involve anyone else <laughs> my wife my wife said no that's not you you you're a feeling kind of guy trade sell we like this in the aviation community, we like systems. We like task saturation. No, we like it task oriented, but we like it in separate compartments. We like it control. We don't like it coming at us without control, okay? So if it comes at us without control, it causes stress. And if you haven't left any wiggle space in the flight profile, you're gonna get yourself in a crack. We like checklists. We don't like surprises, okay? We don't want surprises, no way, okay? What's wrong with ego? Is there anything wrong with ego? How many people think it's bad? Can be. It can be also good. If, if it wasn't for ego, what would happen? You wouldn't even be in there learning how to fly or figure, get better. So it's a control factor that you have to look at in that when it comes to decision making that we talked about, okay? Attitude is a learn to spoke a certain way. You have certain biases you gotta take a look at to people, decisions, and organizations. Okay. You do. My dad was a Missouri Highway Patrolman for 26 years. I grew up flat top, straight up, went to the military 20, 24 years, straight up. When my daughter married Chris, the guy down in Papua New Guinea, cut his foot. When Chris came into the house and I met Chris, Chris had them big holes in his ears. And I'm going, whoa, what the heck is with that? You know, and it's just like, I, it wasn't bad. I was just like, man, that's got to hurt, man. I don't, I, you know, I just... It was something different that I had to say. And then I found out he's the smartest guy in the world. Freaking computers and language and satellites, you know, and I learned to love Chris, but it was different. And you just have differences that you can't let that get in the way flying an airplane in the, in the cockpit. Communication-wise, whatever that bias is, don't get that in the way of good processing of information in the cockpit, okay? And there's some organizations you probably have some objects to, but you just gotta live with it. Don't let it stress you out, okay? Now, I'm going to show you five hazardous attitudes. None of the videos will work, but I'm going to talk to you about them anyway because they're probably one of the reasons why we still crash airplanes and fatigue and stress are not factors involved in that. Anti-authority. Anybody in here anti-authority? How many people? You know, one honest person. The speed limit's 70 on the highway. How many people put the cruise at 76? How many? 80? If you don't go over eight or nine miles, you don't get it. Now, if you put it over there, you usually put it at 76. If the speed limit's 70, why? Because you're not going to, and you're flowing with traffic, you're not going to get it. Ah, you did, Dad, I learned all that stuff. But we process that information, think, well, we could do this because I'm thinking through the process and I know I could do that. I'll make up 30 seconds on the whole pro, profile. You know, that's about all you're going to make. But we think, well, we could do that. We could probably make that up. You can't do that in aviation. In the cockpit of an airplane, you cannot think through like that. You have to have a checklist. You have to go exactly by the regs, black and white, and don't start thinking, well, I could do this, maybe I do this. No, 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 you can't do that, okay? So, follow the rules are usually right, and if you're gonna change something, you better check it out with whoever you're flying or have accountability with somebody to help you out with, okay? This won't work. I know it won't. That's the best video in the whole world. Can't show it to you. Slow down. Every kid that I had that had an accident, the accident was caused because he was what? Or she was in a hurry. Okay? All the accidents in the cars, usually out on the highway, is because somebody is in a hurry. When it comes to aviation and that preparation and planning, that crew briefing, slow down. Take a time out, take a look at it, okay? Because it, 
you need time on the ground. You don't want to be up in the air doing pucker factor, okay? Inter invulnerability, it won't happen to me. Consider the possibility that it could, okay? I went from B-52s to helicopters. It changed a little a bit as far as invulnerability because I didn't have 10 engines with the missiles and the buff. I had one engine and it was all put together by force. <laughs> so the invulnerability, I went, oh man, we better check that out a little deeper. You know, it was, it was just a little more stress for me, okay? Uh, macho, we talked about that, don't take chances, okay? It's foolish, not worth it, okay? Uh, this guy here, is, this one right here, I want to show you this because it won't show it to you. This is a B-52 doing a show up at Fairchild. The book, Into Thin Air, I mean, uh, Darker Shades of Blue, it's out of print, I think, by, I can't think of the guy's name. Um, anyway, there's a whole, it's all the rogue Air Force pilots, and one of them is a whole chapter. This guy, he was a stand out guy up at 325th Bomb Squadron, I don't know where I was at. Nobody would fly, half the squadron wouldn't fly with him. He was a stand out officer, and he was doing a show practice for an air show up there. And, it, and what it shows is he brings it around to make the loop, and he tightens it up, and if B-52, you get to a certain area, you don't get any wing off, movement off the wings, and he basically kills himself, the guy in the co-pilot, and the major waiting for his retirement party on the ground. And he was a rogue pilot, and they knew it. Half the, the guy in the right seat was this flight safety officer, tried to get him out of the cockpit, nobody would fly with him in the practice. And so, once again, you get back there, and you get these guys that are thick to the top guns, and that's just not good, okay? So, resignation, probably the worst of those hazardous attitudes because what happens when you get the resignation? There's no more what? There's no more communication. If you've got a crew and you've got resignation from the first officer to the captain, you've got problems because the captain's not the leader and all of a sudden there's no communication. So now if you don't have a communication, you don't know what people are thinking, okay? By the way, that'll work if you're married. <laughs> Sometimes resignation is a good one. You go take a walk with a dog, just cool things off a little. Not in the cockpit. You need to communicate. You don't need to be sitting around thinking. You don't have a way to say something. If you feel uncomfortable and you're flying with me, I want you to tell me you feel uncomfortable because of this. And that comes with leadership, okay? And that's what you have to set if you're a pilot in your crew and in your cockpit, okay? Attitudes, a closed mind leads to denial of rest and effective communication is shut down. Other factors affect my attitude. Money? Okay. How, what else? How about image? That's the ego business. My two younger daughters, the one that's in the jungle, uh, they were music theater people. They had full scholarships at one time. Just, they were in this. And they, they would say, Dad, don't go out, Norman. I live by the University of Oklahoma. Don't go out there with a T-shirt on. You know, you just wear a, wear a collar shirt. You look so much better. I said, oh, my gosh, I've been there all all my life, I played hoops, and, you know, and, oh, Dad, your mom, my wife even said one day, I went out on a t-shirt, and she said, oh, don't put that t-shirt on. She said, now, this is CRM right here. She said, well, at least tuck your t-shirt in. You don't look so pregnant. Now, that's ugly. You know, that's what I deal with, see, and that's where, I mean, you talk about stress. I did tuck it in, I did look better, but it's, that's not right, you know. I, I tried to show it, but image is important to some people. They, they need that. They need encouragement and stuff. Personality, well, I'm not going to hit that one. Self-criticism, self-analysis. You find me a crew person that can handle that self-criticism and self-analysis on anything, or a crew, a human, and you got somebody that's really sharp. Because I don't care how many tickets they got, how many hours they got, they can learn something new because they're open to some analysis. Say, hey, maybe you could do this better, okay? because that's hard to handle if you're really sharp. You know, the older you get, the better pilot I was, and somebody said, well, maybe you can do it better like this. <laughs> the rookie, you know, that's that macho thing, okay? So, that's my email, okay? I don't think I got anything else down here. This is Everest. This is John Krakauer, if you want to read a good book, okay? He went up to Mount Everest in 1996, and it's a great book on low-grade hypoxia and decision-making. They had a standard operating procedures. You go here, here, and you stop here. Oh, they went on because they only had another hour, and they went on because of the money. The guy said, you've got me up here the second year. You haven't got me to the top. I want you to get me up there. 
And he said, okay, we'll try. They got up there, got caught in the storm, and seven of the people got killed. Two of them were top gun climbers and stuff. They got caught in the storm. So the key is, they said, well, he came back, Jack, he was with them. Krakauer was with them. He came by and he wrote it a year later. He says, check to see if he had the story really right. He said, people with big egos have a hard time with self-analysis or self-criticism. And I knew pilots did because I was one. And then I went to work for the doctors in the Office of Aviation Medicine. They're pretty good. And then I raised seven kids and I looked in the mirror. We all have an issue with that. And you've got to deal with that and say, hey, can I really learn from that? Okay, really can I learn something new? Tools to help manage that CRM training, organizational culture, standard operating procedures, accountability. If you're a solo pilot, find somebody to have accountability with. A hangar buddy, somebody that you can rub off on and say, hey, what do you think? Should I take off or not? Or what, what do you think about this? Because as soon as you look at yourself in the mirror, go, yeah, I can do this. Well, that maybe not. But accountability, now that you have to, to get accountability, you have to get past what? Your ego. Because when you go ask somebody about something, you're saying what? You're not sure that you know the answer. And when you do that, you gotta be a big enough person to say, you know, I'm not sure I know the answer to this thing. And that can be tough for some people. Uh, that's all I got, okay? Any questions? Yes, sir, just a minute and he'll give you a thing. That was pretty quick and dirty. Uh, once again, it's a gray area. I wish I could give you the answer for everything. Thank you. I have two questions. Number one, I find that on the time basis, I got to get there because somebody's waiting for me. I never tell the person that's going to pick me up at the airport to come to the airport until I've landed and I call them to come. That way, in case the weather turns bad or something happens, you don't make a decision because somebody is waiting for you at the FBO. So the answer is I don't call. Tell your people that you're gonna that are gonna pick you up or you're gonna meet. The answer is don't come until I land because by that time you can fuel your plane, you check things out, and uh, it's gonna take them a half hour to get there or whatever. And the second thing, when this dehydration issue, uh, how do I know when that's happening to me? The number one cause of uh, dehydration will be a headache. Well, I say that the doctors will take headache, cramps lower extremities, and if you go take a leak, the darker color urine it is, the more fiber it is, it shouldn't be dark yellow. And you can take a look and you say, well, well you check your urine. I can tell out here, if I don't go to slugs by three or four of those bottles, I go in there and take a leak, yeah. it's not, it's clear. So you can tell with that, and usually another sign is a headache, or you get some cramps in the lower extremities in the evening, or toes, or stuff like that. Before That's, you take off then, how do you check for this issue? Go take a leak in the toilet okay. and take a look at it. All right. No, that's, that's the best thing Is to do. Is that the main... Uh, but you should... Uh, remember this. When you take, in the survival course, you, you were taught, if you, you take, you measure how much you drink. Because if you just take a glass of water and you drink it, the thirst sensation tells your body, ooh, I'm okay. Well, you might not be okay because it says you're not thirsty anymore, but you, you need more water. So you, know, you measure how much you drink. You need to carry a jug to measure how much water you're taking, and you will adjust who you are to the environment that you're in. Like in Oklahoma, when we left, it was like 102, the humidity of 89%. I'd go out in the yard, I'd drink about two jugs of water, two of those bottles, before I got done cutting the grass. And that was on a riding mower, because I sweat like a pig in the humidity. So you gotta take a look at the, the those are the signs. That's the best I can tell you, well, measure it. In the, in the cockpit now and flying, you know, when it's 80 degrees or whatever, even though you get two degrees less as you climb, uh, should you be taking it automatically, just taking some water as you're flying along, say a three hour flight, and it's gonna be hot, and you have no air conditioning in the cockpit? I'd take, I'd take a couple of bottles of water, yeah. you know. I would take some with me, definitely would, yes. Okay. How much, I don't know, I, I'd like to be able to give. The problem with this stuff we talked about it's so, f you're physiologically all different, so I can't tell you. And the environment's gonna be different, but you know if you're gonna be there for three hours, you need to take a couple of jugs of those things of water and slug it about an hour into the flight, okay? Yeah. Uh, you got another one. 
You're only allowed three questions. You know that. No, you're not. You can ask all you want. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Let's assume you're making some mistakes in the cockpit. Uh, and ATC has instructed you to take a heading of 180, uh, you go 150 or 220. Uh, then you recognize that. Should you send some, say something to ATC? Well, I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> in other words, you're, you're, the idea that you should contact somebody, your friend, to see the how, am I doing, how I'm not doing. Yeah. If I miss a couple of headings, for an example, uh, and, and does AT is, ATC probably knows, I've got to watch this guy. Uh, he's, well, you uh, could say, yeah, I tell him, hey, I'm sorry I missed that heading. I'm back to what such and such. Yeah, that'd be yeah. That, just communicate them. Yeah. Just commu they're there to help. Yeah. And, you, and you, know, you, miss, you miss a heading, say, oh, wow, I missed that heading. Don't, I'm sorry about that. What do you want? Yeah. Now, what altitude you at? Are you hypoxic? <laughs> yeah. You could go 9,000 feet and up and get hypoxic. By the way, in the military, you go out there, our tent out there and get hypoxic. Above 10,000 feet, we put the mask on. The FAA says 12.5, right? And you can have another 30 minutes up to 14. The reason that is you can get to the Rockies at that, but you can't get through at 10,000 feet. So what they did is give you a couple of extra thousand feet to kill yourself. <laughs> what I'm saying is you be careful. No, who said that? What was this guy's name? <laughs> what you got to do is you're flying up in that altitude above 9,000 feet, 10,000 feet, you got to take a look at hypoxia and dehydration because there's an effect up there. Okay, you need to take a look at that because that's in the decision-making process. Just take it into effect. Now, a follow-up with the gentleman. Uh, if you feel that way, you can request uh, ATC to do some flight following to keep an eye on you if you feel that way. Yeah. So that's admitting that you, you're aware of it. That's all part of situational awareness. But now you've got a team effort together each accomplishes more safety and efficiency of the cockpit and, so you don't bend metal and then you have a safe flight yep yep anybody else got a question come down to we run an altitude chamber down in oklahoma city we got a dvd out there by the way the dvd out there's got 18 physiology subjects on it with a review section each one and handouts for safety meetings it's out here we have eight of our survival subjects on there and some of the human factor courses are out there on that table out there we run a one-day physiology course in Oklahoma City at the altitude chamber. If you stick around the second day, we do an Arctic desert water jungle. We have a cold chamber. We have a pool. And you can stick around. That's free. We run a 90-day schedule. So at the end of July and the first working day of August, we'll open up the classes in October. And you can call us out in there and find out when we got classes in June of next year but we don't open it up till the 90-day block because we might be having to go somewhere and support research. So if you go FAA.gov, okay, and then the search window put Airman Education, you'll come up with a program or pick up a DVD out there, and it's on there how to get into that program. Plus, there's subjects in there. Now, none of the jokes we told are on there. It's just the, just the DVDs. <laughs> Nathan, Nathan, Nathan. Any other questions? Thank you so much. I'll okay, be before you all go, I'm no. sorry, I didn't mean to jump okay. on you there. But since this may be Rogers' last time, let's give him a standing O. How's oh, that sound? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks a Appreciate lot. That. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. Appreciate it.